Hello, cruel world. What is up, my peoples? My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered offenders for a living so that you don't have to. Today, we're gonna to be speaking about the psychology behind fraud. So, what factors are involved when somebody takes what isn't theirs? Why do some people have these social and moral boundaries, but not others? Why do some people feel so entitled? Why do they think the law doesn't apply to them? I'll be answering all of these questions and many, many more. If you're subscribed to my channel, you will know that often my videos are about extreme violence and about murder. And if you're not subscribed, how can you sleep at night, you wretched, wretched cretin? But I'm gonna do something a bit different in this episode. I'm gonna look at the more common, if less glamorous, offense of fraud. This was all inspired by a Netflix documentary that I saw recently called Bad Sport. The episode is called Hoop Schemes, which is a clever pun on hoop dreams, if you have heard of that documentary. And it was a really interesting, really well-made episode about a massive controversy that happened in Arizona University State basketball team from the 94 to 95 season. So basically, to sum it up, the players were tempted by money and they started point shaving. So I was watching this documentary a few days ago and as I was watching it, I thought, you know who would benefit from my professional insights? You, dear viewers. I think of you like my children. You need to be educated and nurtured, although you're not as cute as my kids and you're not getting any of my inheritance. So what was the scandal at the Arizona State University? Well, they, to put it into context, they'd been quite underachieving in basketball and then they recruited a number of elite players, including Stevin Smith. That's S-T-E-V-I-N Smith. So it's a bit like Steven, but you know, spelt incorrectly. But his nickname was Headache, spelt H-E-A-D-A-K-E. -E. And ironically, the way he's spelt his name and it kept coming on screen in this documentary over and over again caused me pain in my noggin. So what had happened is that Headache Smith ended up owing another student bookie called Benny more than $10,000 in gambling debts. And this person, Benny, recruited the main evil character, the villain of our story, an entrepreneur, by which I mean con artist, the perpetrator, a man whose name that sounds like Pasta Gagliano. And they fixed a basketball game, a basketball that Arizona were due to play against Oregon. State. So Arizona were favourites and they were expected to win by around 12 points and Gagliano bet against them but only by a smaller margin. So he bet that if Oregon State lost by less than six points then he would make a lot of money or even if they won and if they won by six points exactly then he would make even more, he would hit the jackpot. But if Arizona won by more than six points then the bet would be, well he would lose the bet. So that's basically the concept of how point shaving works. It's not just about winning and losing, it's all about the margins. Did you understand that dear viewers? I hope so. If you didn't, go and do some remedial math classes and then come back. Don't worry, I'll wait for you. Go on. One eternity later. You good? All right, let's continue. So, Headache Smith was enlisted to run part of the scam after a couple of dodgy phone calls. And he also got another one of his teammates, a gifted basketball player called Isaac Ice Burton, to be in on the, on the, um, on the corruption. And Ice is a mediocre nickname, I have to say. Iceman is better. Iceman, as basketball fans will know, is the nickname of George Gervin a retired professional basketball player who played for the San Antonio Spurs and the Chicago Bulls. He was known for his slick finger rolls. Iceman is also the nickname for the homoerotic, topless, sweaty antagonist to Tom Cruise's character in the film Top Gun, played by Val Kilmer. You can be my wingman any day, bullshit ice, you can be mine. In retrospect, not the best comeback in movie history, but it's delivered very well by my favorite Scientologist, Tom Cruise. The Iceman is also the nickname for the notorious hitman Richard Kuklinski, who's a mafia assassin, who's convicted of five murders, but he claims to have committed between 100 and 200 even uh, more. By the way, Iceman, if you're watching this, no disrespect intended, please don't kill me. Okay, back to the scandal. So Arizona won by exactly six points, which meant that the two basketball players involved, Headache Smith and Ice Burton, got $20,000 in cash between them by the perpetrator. One of their justifications is that they were extremely impoverished. And in the documentary, Burton says that he literally went to bed hungry and he had to beg other students for food. We'll get back onto that justification later because it is important about the psychology of it all. So apparently Smith insisted that he would only ever do this twice and Gagliano repeated the scan for a second time and he was more emboldened. He, he thought it was going to work so he bet millions of dollars around Las Vegas and he had to place bets of under $10,000 each across the city. 
So he recruited other people, including his own father, to keep the bets under the radar because if they were over that amount, it would have been tracked and they could have led back to him. Why am I mentioning all of this? I think it's significant because this shows that it wasn't just a one-off, impulsive, momentary lack of judgment, but rather a calm and calculated and well thought out scheme. And it worked a second time and Gagliano made a ton of money. What's really interesting to me is they could have walked away at that point. They would have gotten away with it. They probably never would have been found out but obviously the story doesn't end like that. Some of the culprits disagree with what happened next and this was shown in the documentary but according to Gagliano Smith ended up getting in more debt and felt more pressure from another bookie who he told about the scheme so this other bookie bullied Smith into doing it again apparently. So Gagliano felt compelled to get involved for a third and a fourth time until they were finally caught and by this time different people were snooping around including reporters who were suspicious of point shaving and the FBI were involved. So why were these suspicions raised? Well, in the first couple of games, Smith was able to keep the game exactly in the number of points needed, which to me is amazing. It shows that not only was he so talented that he can score what he wanted to, but he was even able to affect the scoring of the entire team. But then the whole thing unraveled because of Smith's behavior during the third game. So during this third game, he himself bet $10,000 on the team and he would have ended up winning a lot of money if he kept that margin down by less than four points. So the team were allowed to lose, but it had to be less than four points because the people they were playing were the favorites. And his team was six points behind with only a few seconds left in the game. So he needed to close that gap to four points or less. So Smith was desperate and he tried really hard to make the last shot, sprinted on the court, tried really hard and he missed. And he seemed really crushed and disappointed when he missed. But nobody else on his team and the fans could understand why he cared so much about that shot because it didn't make sense. The team, were, they were behind six points. So Arizona would have lost anyway. Even if he made the bucket, it would have been three points. He still would have lost by three points. So basically Smith wasn't very subtle with his actions. So dear viewers, my advice to you is if you're ever the point guard in a game and you're stuck in the middle of a point shaving scandal be subtle about that last shot so lots of other people around this time found out about the scam and they placed similar bets on the fourth game many more bets that would have been expected that for such a low key college uh, college basketball game which again raised suspicions then it was investigated by investigated by the fbi and everybody eventually was caught. So Smith, Gagliano, and the original student bookie, Benny, all of them ended up going to prison. Ice was sentenced to two months in jail only. Why did Ice get off so easily? Because he's a slippery character. Yeah, I went there. High five, high five. Headache was an exceptionally talented player and he was due to make the NBA, although he wasn't drafted. And it seems that this was related to scandalous rumors before his arrest. And it seemed that the NBA didn't want to touch him due to these corrupt insinuations and this controversy. Anyway, let's look at some of the psychological processes in this case. I'll try and mix it up with a bit of psychobabble, but let's boil it down to its basics. The basic issue here is simply greed. You don't need a psychiatrist with a gold tooth whose mother says that he's the most handsome man in the world to tell you that. They could have got away with it, as I said before, if they'd just stuck to their two games, as Headache Smith had originally said. But greed is a very powerful motivator. Every time I try and get out, they keep pulling me back in. There is the argument that Burton made, which was that he was living in poverty and he was so poor that he could barely afford any food. Now, I recognize that I'm relatively privileged, so obviously I can't talk about what it must have been like for him at that moment struggling financially. But also I would say that it's not clear how accurate this was. This is what he said during the documentary. Was he actually really literally starving? I don't know. Having said all that, what he didn't mention in the documentary was that he was on a scholarship at this university. I mean, he was definitely there on his own merit in the first place. I know that. And it was through his talent and his hard work. I recognize that. But he had this advantage of having his education paid for, which could have set him up for a career for life. And Ice also made the point that him and all the other players were playing really hard. They were doing the hard work, but the university itself and the people around it were getting this attention. They were getting money for, for his hard work, which is a fair point. But like I said, he gets something in return. Not only were they on, was he on a scholarship, same as Headache, which gave him free education, but they were treated like rock stars. They had lots of fame, lots of attention. Ice and Headache both talked about this in the documentary. So I'm not convinced that they were being exploited here. What do you think, dear viewers? Let me know in the comments. Plus, this is important, Ice and Headache used the money that they won from these games to buy car accessories
accessories, fancy cars, clothes and jewelries, which actually is another reason that the reporters became suspicious. They didn't use them to fight poverty, they weren't used on food or essentials. And even primary school criminality, class 101 teaches you that you gotta spread your money subtly. You don't spend it immediately, you spend it gradually over time, you know that. I think another big factor is simply ego and narcissism. So just to be clear, I think this is circumstantial. I don't think it's pathological. So if I was to assess ice and headache, I think it's very unlikely that I would diagnose them with like a psychiatric disorder, like narcissistic personality disorder, for example. By the way, if you're interested in narcissism, go check out my video, Narcissist versus Psychopaths. It's dope. You Bombay. During the documentary, Smith was asked about whether he was worried about being caught whilst he was point shaving. And he replied, I didn't think we would be touched at the time. You know, we were superstars. So they literally felt they were beyond the law and beyond approach. And this is also reflected by the very way they spent their money, which I just mentioned. The very fact that they told other people about this scan was another huge reason for their downfall. And to me, this reflects egocentricism, narcissism, and basically showing off, i.e. they can beat the system. They shouldn't have told other people, they should have kept their mouth shut. Another big psychological factor at play for me would be their justifications. And this was seen in the documentary, it really stood out for me. And it was different in the different culprits in, in kind of, you know, disparate ways. For example, Headache Smith justified it in his head because he was still allowed to win the games, which was most important to him. So he believed he wasn't letting anybody down because they were still winning the games. He was just decreasing the margin of the wins intentionally so that he would win money and bet. And he also kind of insinuated that this was a victimless crime and that nobody would be hurt. But that, of course, is untrue. Other players within the team Teams were the biggest victims. They felt betrayed by the actions of the two other players. In fact, at least one or possibly another player talks about this in the documentary, how disappointed, how crushed they were to find out what happened. And the coaches and the fans, they're all victims. And it damaged the reputation of Arizona State University basketball program irreversibly. Another form of justification, which I mentioned before, was Ice Burton. So he rationalized it by thinking that everybody was making money off him whilst he was struggling financially. Another kind of justification was from Gagliani in the in the documentary. I thought it was really interesting. So he reckons that he tried to dissuade Smith to do it for the third game, but Smith and this other bookie insisted. So Gagliano felt that it was going to happen anyway. I might as well uh, help them set it up and help them. So he justified it as him helping his friend, which to me isn't true. So this whole thing screams of a psychological process where somebody's actions are not aligned to their feelings, their ideas, their beliefs, and their values. Can you, dear viewers, tell me what this psychological process is called? I will tell you the answer shortly, but first I'd like to introduce you to this channel. You are watching A Psych for Sore Minds. My name is Dr. Shahan Das. I'm a consultant, forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered offenders in prisons and in courts and in psychiatric units. This channel has loads of different topics about the crossover between mental illness and offending. Some of my videos are about high profile cases, some of them about my own patients, anonymized that I talk about, some of them about diagnoses, something about criminality. What I'm trying to say is it's a big smorgasbord of information and there's something for everybody on this channel. Please, I implore you to subscribe. Not only does it help me out immeasurably, but it actually prevents babies on planes from crying every time you take a flight for the rest of your life guaranteed or your money back. So I mentioned a psychological process where somebody's actions are not aligned to their feelings, their ideas, their beliefs and their values. And this causes psychological stress. What's this called? Drum roll, please. Any budding psychologists out there? It is? Huh? Huh? Cognitive dissonance. If you got that correct, buy yourself a cookie and you can bill me. If you got that incorrect, go to the closest mirror, slap yourself in the face, you will amount to nothing. So dear viewers, can you give me an example or two of other types of cognitive dissonance, either theoretical or real life cases you've heard about or real life experiences you've lived yourself? Let me know in the shmoment shmechen shmelo. You Bombay. Another interesting psychological aspect is that Stephen Smith called himself Headache Smith and he conceptualized himself almost as a separate character. He even said in the documentary that Headache got Stephen Smith into trouble. I think it's really important to clarify that people might have alter egos, but that doesn't mean they're different characters or different entities. I think to a degree, all of us have different versions of ourselves that we project in disparate scenarios. I'm obviously usually quite generally sort of serious 
when I'm at work. I'm quite formal and I intentionally use complicated words when I'm giving evidence in court cases on the witness stands. And that's because my vocabulary is um, good. And because I talk, um, what's the word? Good. So I'm a bit more of my natural self when I'm making these YouTube videos. I'm very silly and very playful when I'm with my kids. I'm very charming, I'm very flirtatious when I'm with your mum. So yeah, different versions. Some people might channel certain attitudes or traits at times, particularly professional sportsmen. So for example, an MMA fighter or a boxer, they have to be in the right mindset before they get into that ring. They have to feed off and channel their aggression and their tension. They have to have that killer instinct, but they can't feel like this all the time, obviously, because they would just be miserable. They'd probably turn psychotic. They'd probably end up in the forensic psychiatric services being assessed by myself. So I'm sure that going into beast mode was helpful for Headache Smith. Some people take it even further and think of themselves as two separate characters with different names, such as Headache, spelt wrong, and Stevin, spelt wrong, Smith. However, here's the crucial bit. They are not separate entities. Stephen Smith was fully aware of headache and vice versa when he was switching between these two modes, which is very different to a psychiatric disorder where you have different personalities such as dissociative identity disorder, which is also known as split personality. The key here is the word dissociative. So dissociative means being disconnected to thoughts, to memories, to the surroundings, to the actions, to the identity, to all of those things of the other character. So one identity is completely unaware of the other one and they're completely unaware of the existence of the other one and they have different values. So arguably Headache was more confident and had more of a kind of gung-ho carefree attitude than Stephen Smith and he probably thought less about the consequences of his actions and this is related to be him being a super superstar. Those things are probably true but there is no psychiatric reason that either version would have not known what the other one was doing and would not have known that it was irresponsible and illegal. I'm mentioning all of this because for those not in the know, there might be a temptation of thinking that just because somebody has two different versions of themselves, that there's some sort of psychiatric illness like split personalities and that this might have an effect on criminal culpability. That simply is not true. What I'm trying to say, if Slim Shady says something really offensive, Eminem can't shirk responsibility. If you're interested in dissociative identity disorder, you should look at the case of the Hillside Strangler who tried to use this defense, although he was caught out by a very clever, crafty forensic psychologist. From memory, I'm sure at least one or two of you have asked me to do a video on him. Uh, if, you, if other viewers that are watching this now want me to do that, please let me know in the comments below. I can break down the psychoanalysis of the Hillside Strangler. So to conclude this episode, this is a very interesting case. Fraud has many psychological processes. Greed obviously is at the heart of all of the cases. Like the great philosopher Socrates once said, cash rules everything around me, cream, get the money, dollar, dollar, bill, your. More than that, it was about arrogance, narcissism, and entitlement of the perpetrators. Not keeping secrets, overspending everything eventually led to their failure. However, to me, despite all of that, biggest tragedy is the case of Headache Smith. I mean, to be fair to him, the man you know, admits that it's his fault, he takes responsibility, so I give him credit for that. But he had potential, he could have made it to the NBA. He could have potentially been on contracts worth tens or even hundreds of million dollars and he blew it all away for $10,000 a game. And he used that money to buy a nice car and some rims and some framers. So to me, this shrieks of immaturity. Would I have been tempted to do the same thing if I was in his position? Would you be tempted? Because there's no danger of that happening to you because you dribble like you have arthritis and you can't even make a layup. So anything else to say about this episode? Um, Boy Lion? Ah, yeah, thank you for that, yeah almost forgot. I have a book that's going to be out in March 2022. It's going to be called Into Minds. Check the link. It's autobiographical. It's about the life of a forensic psychiatrist. Go check it out. Please tell more people about this channel. I'm a weak man and I need revalidation, so I need more subs. Until next time, stay euthymic and do not forget, I love you.